This is an orientation session for Unit 2, Protection Systems for Wooden Built Heritage in Japan, for the 2023 ACCU Group Training Course on Cultural Heritage Protection in the Asia-Pacific region. I am pleased to have this opportunity to present the outline of the current legal framework for the restoration of cultural properties in Japan. I hope this will provide you with a useful framework and knowledge to better understand the lectures presented in Unit 2. I would like to proceed with my presentation according to the three topics shown on the screen. First, categories and classes of built heritage under the law for the protection of cultural properties. Second, basic rules for the restoration of built heritage under the law. And third, differences in legal treatment by categories and classes. The first topic is categories and classes of built heritage under the law. Heritage conservation in Japan is generally centered on the Cultural Properties Protection Law of 1950, which covers just about everything from tangible to intangible, from site to landscape, and from cultural to natural matters. All photographs shown on the screen are designated cultural properties under the Cultural Properties Protection Law. The law defines six categories of cultural property. The first category is tangible cultural properties. The second is intangible cultural properties. The third is folklore cultural properties. The fourth is monuments. The fifth is cultural landscape. And the sixth is historic districts. In terms of built heritage, it is mainly involved with either tangible cultural properties or historic districts, and both basically share ideas and methodologies for preservation and restoration. But the law sets different rules according to difference in value evaluation. In addition, there are two classes of national certification for tangible cultural properties. One is the designation. And the second is the registration. Here, I show you a visualized model of the legal definition and try to simply explain the concept of the designation and registration system for tangible cultural properties. This three-dimensional cube represents all existing historic buildings, and those buildings are considered as heritage buildings in potential status. All historic buildings which meet the criteria could be inscribed on the National Cultural Property Registry. The criteria of registration is for buildings that are over 50 years old, and they must retain their original architectural features in aspects of design, technique, or landscape. A designated cultural property, which is ensured of preservation by the government, needs to be carefully selected from the heritage value perspective. The heritage value of historic buildings is initially evaluated and developed on an architectural typology basis. From the standpoint of architectural typology, Historic buildings are mainly classified and analysed by building type, architectural style, and the period of construction. We have developed several categories of historic buildings through academic or scientific research. And buildings which represent each category of architectural typology could be selected as designated cultural property by the government. This concept model can be simplified like this. The main objective of a registered cultural property is the concept that the cultural property is visible by its listing. It is a kind of watch list of cultural properties in a social context. There is no legal obligation for the preservation of cultural properties owners. On the other hand, the objective of a designated cultural property 
is to be inherited successively into the future and must definitely be preserved. Therefore, the government sets strict regulations for the preservation of a designated cultural property, and owners are legally obliged to preserve the property in a good condition. Today, over 13,000 buildings are inscribed as registered cultural properties, and around 2,500 sets of buildings are designated by the government. Let me move to the next topic – basic rules for the restoration of built heritage under the law. Whether it is tangible cultural properties or historic districts, under the designation or the registration, the basic rules for preserving heritage buildings are the same. It is crucial for appropriate heritage conservation to determine what we must maintain and inherit in a concrete sense through assessing heritage significance. For instance, in the case of traditional farmhouses, if we could just focus on the historical or academic value of the buildings. We evaluate it as a vernacular house with typical characteristics of a certain period and region, represented here by a gabled thatched roof and unique frame structure. The basis for the preservation or restoration of heritage buildings is for every stakeholder to share in the recognition of their heritage values and a consciousness to protect them. And the most important thing is for the building owners or custodians to keep them in sound condition through daily maintenance and management, based on such recognition and consciousness. However, buildings usually have other crucial values besides their heritage value. For instance, owners need to make a living with their building, and they may even use the building for their business. In such cases, we also need to have a common recognition of how we can reconcile heritage values with other property values. For that, other than to recognise what their essential value of heritage is, we must consider how to use them for disseminating heritage values. Their commercial or other potentials, required feasible management systems, etc. We make a conservation management plan if needed for organising and sharing various requirements for the preservation and utilisation of the heritage building. In short, the conservation management plan is how to balance both the preservation and utilisation of a heritage building. We assure that conservation management plans allow for the conservation and the development of heritage buildings by keeping or enhancing their heritage values. Let me move to the third topic – differences in legal treatment by categories and classes. First, let's look at the differences between the two classes of tangible cultural properties – the designation and the registration. Here, let me reconfirm the difference in meaning between designation and registration. The objective of a designated cultural property is to be inherited successively into the future. Those properties must certainly be preserved. Therefore, the government sets strict regulations for the preservation of a designated cultural property. In other words, the government is responsible for ensuring that the heritage value is not lost or diminished. On the other hand, the objective of a registered cultural property can be said that, conceptually, the cultural property is made visible by its listing. There is no legal obligation for preservation by the cultural property's owners. Only reports to the government are required when they plan or have done modifications to their property. And if the government identifies that the changes have resulted in a loss of heritage values, the registration will be cancelled.
Next, I will show you the legal process for the designation and the registration of cultural property. First, the designation. The law requires the government to establish a secretariat and council in charge of heritage conservation. The secretariat and council take responsibility for keeping track of the social situation of cultural properties nationwide, and the direct designation and safeguarding of those considered to be important from a national perspective. The basis of the legal process for the registration is left to each local authority or community. Under the law, municipal governments take responsibility for their area and designate and safeguard cultural properties that are considered to be important from their own perspective. And the law allows municipal governments to provide the national government with candidates for registered cultural properties. In principle, the government will inscribe in the registry all properties confirmed to meet the criteria for registered cultural properties. The main purpose of the registration system is to ensure things that qualify for cultural properties are visible and, consequently, to draw society's attention to their existence. There is a big difference here when compared to the designation system in that the property is not ensured of preservation. Let's have a look in practice at how we ensure the authenticity of heritage buildings through the restoration work. Before restoration, a building generally has had some or many modifications and additions over time. This means that any existing building will usually have changed from its original condition, such as a modification fit into reasonable materials and additions adopted to lifestyle changes. Regarding designated cultural properties, as mentioned earlier, the government has set regulations maintaining the status quo of cultural properties. Thus, restoration planning by a skillful conservation architect who has sufficient experience and knowledge of heritage buildings is very important. To sustain and improve the value of cultural property, it is required to have a government-approved conservation architect for government-funded preservation work on designated cultural properties. The government also provides training programs to develop conservation architects' skills to properly handle those designated cultural properties. On the process of preservation work, Firstly, a conservation architect makes an initial preservation plan for startup. And, through controlling preservation work on site, he or she remakes the plan as necessary, including alterations for improving the condition from a heritage value perspective. And will request permission of a revised plan to the government if needed. If the revised plan is appropriate, mainly from a preservation-oriented point of view, the government will give permission. As a result of the preservation work, in many cases the building has been restored to a certain form with details of a particular period of time, largely due to the removal of later work and the return of earlier elements that were once there, during the latest period of construction and restoration. Regarding registered cultural properties, the motivation for their conservation is basically left to the market. Therefore, their conservation work is usually the owner's idea of who needs to renovate them and is undertaken by a private architect engaged in general design work. We call private architects heritage managers who have certain knowledge about heritage buildings. I will give you the outline later. The architect, or heritage manager, considers how the building should be preserved in planning the renovation according to the owner's request. Renovation plans must be reported to the government in advance if modifications are expected 
to exceed a certain space. This is because the government needs to keep track of the status of registered cultural properties. Then, if necessary, the government provides advice or recommendations from the heritage conservation point of view. Here, in the case of renovation to the cafeteria. The architect considers the earthen hall renovated into a guest lounge, which originally served as a farm work and cooking area. On the other hand, the parlour, which is kept well and to the traditional design, will be preserved. The latest style washroom will be installed in the additions. As you know, modern sanitary facilities are an essential part of restaurant management. Such a balance between renovation and preservation as a heritage building is possible with the ingenuity of a competent architect. Moreover, unprecedented methods of architectural conservation may even be developed through accumulating such cases. However, in the renovation of a historic building in general, the creative design often takes precedence and historic elements are often treated only as decorative components or an added bonus. For registered cultural properties, if such renovations are done and have resulted in the loss of certain space of the property, the government shall cancel their registration. Needless to say, the government will give advice and recommendations against such renovations and suggest plans be revised to an appropriate standard. In order to encourage private architects with appropriate knowledge of the preservation and renovation of heritage buildings, training and networking programs for heritage managers are offered at the prefectural level, supported by the government. Regarding historic districts, there are totally different procedures from those of tangible cultural properties. The law gives the legal right of decision-making directly to municipal governments, because it is important for the evaluation of an historic district not only to assess the regional diversity, but also to consider the living environment for the local residents. Under the law, municipal governments can enact bylaws and designate historic districts. The role of the government is to support and give technical advice to municipal governments and also, the government can select nationally important historic districts among municipal designations. Needless to say, a historic district is basically an accumulation of traditional houses, which means it is an ensemble of tangible cultural properties. Now, over 25,000 traditional houses are protected as authorised traditional buildings of national selected historic districts. It can be said to be a huge number when compared to the number of designated or registered buildings as tangible cultural properties. Using a typical model of historic quarters, let me look at the difference in thinking about heritage when compared to tangible cultural properties. Many historic Japanese towns have a structure in which private residential premises are lined up along the street. Usually, a river flows behind the residential premises of one side, with mountains or woodland on the other side. When we consider designating traditional houses to tangible cultural properties, but first, we need to evaluate its value of significance individually and physically from the perspective of historical evidence or a work of art. On the other hand, when we consider identifying old quarters of historic districts, we need to evaluate historic houses, not only as an element, but as a whole, from the perspective of the cultural historical environment. So, the target range to be legally preserved is basically limited to the outward appearance of the buildings. The inside of the buildings are not subject to preservation. But please note that this is not a negative choice, 
from the perspective of heritage conservation. It is because the daily lives of the residents are the basis for a healthy inheritance of the historical, cultural value of towns or villages. Besides the governmental support for the preservation and restoration of traditional buildings, another unique feature of the historic district system is that the government can support the construction of new buildings or structures on the premises or areas in the district where the historic environment has already been lost. In Japanese, it is called shuke, meaning landscaping or beautification. However, shuke is intended to restore continuity and wholeness of the streetscape or landscape and is not a means for conservation. As well as tangible cultural properties, it is incredibly important in the conservation of historic districts to maintain individual traditional buildings in a sound condition. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for watching and for your kind attention.